Harper. Sri Lanka is one of those media stories we keep going back to here at the Listening Post for good reason. There was last year's final chapter in the civil war there in which the news media were largely locked out of the battle zone. There was that video that appeared on the internet which the United Nations says shows government soldiers executing Tamil prisoners. There was the newspaper editor shot and killed who it turned out predicted his own murder and in an editorial published posthumously accused the country's president of being responsible for his death. And now that same president, Mahinda Rajapaksa, and the military man who led Sri Lankan forces to victory against the Tamil rebels are facing off in an election that will determine who will lead the next government in Colombo. Our starting point this week is the media story in Sri Lanka. Is there free and fair coverage of the election campaign? And how can there be when journalists are still getting death threats just for doing their jobs? On New Year's Day, halfway through the election campaign, 13 million Sri Lankans heard their mobile phones beep. We all received a text message from the president wishing us a happy new year. And I think a lot of people were like, wow, uh, I mean, the president sent me a message. A personal message that happened to be illegal. The Sri Lanka Regulatory Telecommunications Commission actually ordered private mobile companies to send out this SMS free of charge. So they broke all laws in the country because they are a state institution, a government institution. And by doing this, they gave Mahinda Rajapaksa undue advantage over all his other opponents. Control over Sri Lanka's telecommunications authority is one advantage that President Rajapaksa has over his chief rival, General Sarat Fonseca. Not surprisingly, the president is also the preferred candidate of the country's two state-funded TV channels. And state-funded television is the trump card that stacks the deck in the incumbent's favor. Whichever government that has been looks at it as our PL agencies. And I think that is, that is what has happened. They are being used as agencies that are there to propagate a certain line for the government. They are entirely dependent on the government to function. State TV has given some coverage to General Sarat Fonseca and perhaps some of the other candidates. But nevertheless, in all their news broadcasts, in most of their political talk shows, Mahinda Rajapaksa dominates. The problem here is that when the private media looks at the state media and, and starts acting reactionary, then it's like, you know, we are in a huge mess here. Because when the other media looks at it and says, oh, these guys are doing this, there is a huge vacuum on the other side, we have to feel that. But what we get is, it's like the opposite beat to what the government media is setting. Sri Lankans don't trust any particular media source if they stop to think about it. We are a highly politicized society. I guess this happens in any society, particularly ones in which you suppress what is happening. The Sri Lankan media have never been more suppressed than they were during the final stages of the civil war, which ended in May. With an end game seemingly in sight, daring to question the Sri Lankan government or the military can be deadly. The government barred the media from most of the war zone. The fighting took place out of camera range. The complaints of journalists fell mostly on deaf ears, since much of the domestic media backed the government and celebrated the result. If you go back to the war, yes, the media was muscled to a, to a huge extent. The media couldn't go out except for several state-run outlets. Nobody could go out there and say, look, we are reporting from the front, because nobody was allowed access like that. Now, it, but that's not the case with, with the election. What the election has done is to open up a space open up a space in the media for a debate and discussion of issues which may have been taboo in any other situation. During the war, the Tamil media was perceived and seen to be by the government as pro-LTTE or pro-Tiger. As a result, a large number of Tamil journalists were intimidated, harassed, threatened. However, after the election was declared, there has been a significant change. And you can see how this government is actually wooing the Tamil media to help them lobby for a Tamil vote. 
Hovering over the election campaign was the story of that mobile phone video from the war which surfaced through a group called JDS, Journalists for Democracy, in Sri Lanka. The video apparently shows government soldiers executing Tamil prisoners. The government denounced the video as a fake but failed to prove that. Just three months after the Sri Lankan government declared the country liberated from the Tamil Tigers, video footage has emerged apparently showing government troops summarily executing Tamils. Britain's Channel 4, the first to broadcast it, maintains the video is genuine. And a recent United Nations investigation concluded the same thing. The conclusion clearly is that the videotape is authentic. JDS members will only be interviewed anonymously. This one told us the Sri Lankan media have shied away from this part of the election story. Unfortunately, the findings of the UN are not widely covered in Sri Lankan media, which is a sad thing because we believe that if the general public have access to the material, then they can make a learned decision, especially in an election time. All of JDS's members have fled Sri Lanka, saying they feared for their lives. They are watching the election at a safe distance, wondering if under a new government anything will change for the news media. We hope that first and foremost any government that comes into power should take very strong steps to go against those who have been oppressing the media during the last couple of years. That gives a clear signal to the journalists who are in the country and outside the country, yes, we can work in a free and fair manner. There has just been too many attacks, too many abductions, too many murders. 29 journalists have left this country. They continue to live in exile. We at the Sunday Leader continue to come under attack and threat and intimidation by this government. So yes, we are hoping that if there is a change, that it will bring about greater media freedom. Frederica Jans became the editor of her paper when her predecessor was murdered. In his posthumously published editorial, Lasantha Wickramatunga didn't just predict his own murder, he foretold the course of the investigation. Speaking directly to President Rajapaksa, Wickramatunga wrote, In the wake of my death, I know you will make all the usual sanctimonious noises and call upon the police to hold a swift and thorough inquiry. But like all the inquiries you have ordered in the past, nothing will come of this one too. Wickramatunga was no clairvoyant. He was just a reporter who knew that when journalists are killed in Sri Lanka, the wheels of justice turn slowly and go nowhere. Here's how our Global Village voices see the state of the news media in Sri Lanka. We can't say that even though the war is over, violence against Sri Lanka's independent media is a thing of the past. Of course, we are extremely happy that well-known journalist uh, J.S. Thissanayagam was granted bail this week. Uh, President Obama last year referred to this as an emblematic example of reporters jailed for their work. But it's been a year since the brutal murder of another journalist, uh, the editor of the Sunday leader, Lasantha Vikramatunga. No one has been brought to justice over the murder. Because the perpetrators of these crimes are still out there, and because terrible laws like the Prevention of Terrorism Act are still in our statute books, the future for independent media still looks rather bleak, irrespective of who wins the presidential elections around the corner. I don't know who killed Lasantha, but I don't think the government is that interested. In this culture, things only move, there's pressure from the top, and there isn't. Sri Lanka used to have a vibrant press at the time of independence in 1948. It has taken half a century of meddling by successive government to bring it to its current pass. Now it looks like nothing short of constitutional and institutional safeguards will help restore it 